a good evening to you and so today we are going to discuss the genus fasciola under the phylum platyhelminthes and class trematoda as uh, you know that the phylum platyhelminthes is also known as flat worm as the structure of the parasites under the phylum platyhelminthes are flat in shape so all the parasites under the phylum platyhelminthes are called flat worm and this platyhelminthes or the flat worm has also two categories one is fluke or trematode and another is tapeworm or cystode so we will first discuss about the trematodes and, and among the trematodes the first important genus is fasciola under the family fasciolidae f a c i o l i d a e fasciolidae there are four important genera what are those fasciola fasciolopsis fasciolidae and parafasciolopsis and among them the most important one is fasciola and we will discuss the fasciola i think the fasciola is very much common to you and has been it has been it is available or it is been prevalent throughout the world and it is one of the most important and one of the most harmful parasite to the host and causing a great economical loss to the host and every year a huge economical loss has occurs due to this parasites and there is always uh, efforts have been made every time to reduce the effect of this parasite or to get rid of this parasite that is the fasciola in fasciola there are two important genera are there fasciola hepatica and fasciola gigantica okay now coming to the host it uh, the fasciolidae family the all the uh, parasites under the fasciolidae family i told you there are four genus okay so this fasciolidae genus uh, fasciolidae family the most commonly occurring animals are sheep goat cattle and other ruminants now coming to the uh, uh, difference coming to the difference between fasciola gigantica and fasciola hepatica fasciola gigantica is very large in size but is hepatic and small in size and fasciola hepatica this uh, has and the intermediate host for fasciola hepatica and fasciola gigantica are different uh, i only have to mention that the intermediate host for this parasite fasciola hepatica and gigantica are snail but for gigantica the snail is limnia rufescens and lumnia uh, sorry limnia auriculata and for hepatica it is limnia tomentosus and lumnia bulimoides and uh, also lumnia tranquillata fasciola gigantica are more abundant in tropical countries whereas fasciola hepatica is more abundant in temperate countries so again uh, coming to the host if i have already said that cattle sheep goat and other ruminants are the general host so other than these elephant horse pig dog and cats are also getting gets affected for this animal so by these parasites and then coming to the site where these parasites are found so this parasite the fasciola is found in bile duct and liver so if anyone asks you that what is the liver fluke so the answer should be fasciola because it is a fluke and it is found in the liver of the animal liver and bile duct of the animal and what are the disease caused by this parasite the disease is fasciolosis or liver fluke disease or liver rot the disease caused by fasciola is fasciolosis or liver fluke disease or liver rot <coughs> and in case of india as i have told you that fasciola gigantica is prevalent in tropical countries so in india also fasciola gigantica is prevalent right so now coming to the life cycle okay as we have already discussed previously that uh, maximum the uh, the parasites they may have two type of host one is definitive host and another is intermediate host what is definitive host the host in which the sexual maturity is obtained for the parasite is definitive host and in intermediate host 
There is also developmental changes occurred in that in, in that parasite, but not sexual maturity. That is intermediate host. In fasciola, the definitive host are these ruminants, cattle, sheep, goat, and in the intermediate host are different species of snail. I have already mentioned what are these uh, snail species: Limnia tranquillata, Limnia auriculata, Limnia uh, bulimoides, Limnia rufescens, etc., etc. And what are the different uh, developmental stages of the fasciola? The stages are egg, miracidium, sporocyst, radia, sarcidia, metasarcidia, and adult. I repeat, egg, miracidium, sporocyst, radia, sarcidia, metasarcidia, and adult. Again, I repeat, egg, miracidium, sporocyst, radia, sarcidia, metasarcidia, and adult. And most importantly. Meta sarcaria is the infective stage. I repeat, meta sarcaria is the infective stage for this parasite. Now coming to the details of the life cycle of this parasite, that is fasciola. First, <clears throat> the eggs of this parasite are expelled out from the host. And what is the most common way of expelling out the host? Obviously, it will be expelled out through the feces. With the feces of the host the egg is expelled out in the environment so the egg now comes into the environment right then in presence of certain environmental factor like temperature humidity etc etc miracidium develops in the egg so from egg to formation of miracidium then this miracidium hatches within the few days and the miracidium it is a roughly triangular and has a ciliated uh, covering which is actively motile and can move from one place to another place. So from egg to the next stage is miracidium and most important is that miracidium can move from one place to another place. Okay. And now it comes, there comes the intermediate host. I told you the intermediate host is a snail. Snail secrete certain type of chemicals and this miracidium follow these chemicals and reaches towards the snail. So certain chemicals which are secreted by the snails they attract the miracidiums and miracidium reaches towards the snail and penetrates the soft tissue of the snail and enters into the snail. So miracidium, so egg comes into the environment, egg hatches into the environment and uh, uh, sorry, means uh, egg develops into the miracidium in presence of certain environmental factors and this miracidium which can move from one place to another place reaches to the snail and enters into the snail through the soft tissue. And then within the snail, there are certain developmental stages. I have already uh, mentioned after miracidium, there is sporocyst, radia, and sarcidia. Most importantly, within the snail, sporocyst, then radia, and then sarcidia. And these stages occur in the lymph spaces of the snail. Where this uh, 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 phages occur, these phages that is the sporocyst, radia, and sarcidia, they occur in the lymph spaces of the snail. Then the sarcaria comes out of the snail. Then what happens? Sarcaria comes out of the snail. As I have told you, miracidium enters into the snail, develops into porosist radia sarcaria, and now sarcaria comes out of the snail. Okay. And this sarcaria it also has tail appendages and can move from one place to another place and can also swim. Okay, this sarcaria has these characteristics. Now, what happens? This sarcaria they crawl on the grass blades and aquatic vegetation as you know when there will be if there is a pond or lake or some stagnant water etc there snails are found there and from the snails the sarcaria comes out and this sarcaria they will cross crawl to, uh, to the grasses or other aquatic plants or vegetations which are available commonly around the pond or lake or the water bodies okay and the and this sarcaria is converted into or develops into metasarcaria and i told you metasarcaria is the infective stage and this metasarcaria is resistant to the environment it's somehow resistant to the environment so metasarcaria stage that is present on the grass around the vegetation of the water bodies now very interestingly if there is water bodies so definitely vegetation will be there around the water bodies and our animals domestic animals who used to gray around this grassland will definitely come towards the water bodies for drinking water and also for the grasses or vegetation that are available around these water bodies 
so they will ingest those grasses and those grass or the leaves or the grass blades they contain that metasarcaria stage which is the infective stage for the animal and this metasarcaria stage they comes inside the animal through ingestion and comes where they come they will uh, uh, in, uh, they comes inside the animal and then there will be ex cystations this metasarcaria stage and the immature fluke now there will be development of immature fluke they pass through the abdominal cavity and subsequently where it is uh, the target organ for this parasite is the liver so it reaches the it penetrates the liver capsule reaching the parenchymatous tissue while in the fluke migrates for a long duration and this flukes reach bile duct and become sexually matured in the bile duct thus it's uh, reached into the bile duct and the cycle completes now coming to the pathogenesis what are the different conditions that occur in a following this uh, fasciola uh, ingestion of the fasciola or after causing the infection of these parasites the conditions are the lesions or pathogenesis are peritonitis hepatitis certainly there will be hepatitis as it invades the liver and bile ducts hyperplastic cholangitis pipe stem liver condition hazel nut cyst formation these are the conditions or pathogenesis that occurs i repeat peritonitis hepatitis hyperplastic cholangitis pipe stem liver condition hazel nut cyst formation the pathogenesis of fasciola can be of two types first is acute and another is chronic but the acute is not common in case of animals but it can also occur sometime for example if uh, there is high amount of large number of metasarcaria ingested at a time in that due to that the acute uh, pathogenesis can occur and in this uh, stage the juvenile or the immature parasites they mainly cause the infection and it has been observed the sheep are have generally suffer from the acute fasciolosis okay and these immature parasites they get entry into the liver from the peritoneum and immature flukes penetrate the liver capsule and proceed to the liver parenchymatous tissue and forming many tunnels they form tunnels in the liver whenever they will try to penetrate the liver okay and these tunnels are filled by large amount of clotted blood fibrinous material and other cellular debris and this occurs massive destruction of the hepatic architecture that's very much normal when it penetrates the liver tissue forming tunnels so the, the, certainly there will be destruction of the liver arch, sorry hepatic architecture inflammatory reactions will be there perforation of the liver capsule will leads to drainage of the blood into the peritoneal cavity which is easily discernible at the time of the autopsy or infected animals and the drainage of blood in the peritoneal cavity results into peritonitis as i have already told to mention previously one of the pathogenesis is peritonitis along with hepatitis and this immature liver fluke they can cause destroy the hepatic cells in many of the cases it has been found that immature flukes are dead and this situation results in condition getting more aggravated so these are the events that occur during the acute pathogenesis then comes to chronic pathogenesis and this chronic pathogenesis it is very much common in case of cattle and these animals in chronic so definitely the animals suffer for a long time and due to constant irritation by the uh, tegumental spine and the presence of this parasite for a long period of time in the infection chronic pathogenesis starts and it is because of deposition of large amount of fibrous tissue resulting in hepatic fibrosis okay and in fact fibrosis is inevitably occurs as a process of healing and regeneration of lesions in the parenchymatous tissue caused by the coagulative necrosis so parasites are there it will invade the liver so eventually when the liver starts healing there will be the fibrosis of the liver okay and the bile duct is also thickened due to this fibrosis of the lamina propria of the bile duct and which is called hyperplastic cholangitis hyperplastic cholangitis inflammation of the bile duct okay and it's also the hyperplasia so hyperplastic cholangitis two types of hyperplasia occurs these are glandular and the papillary type okay another important thing is that edema is also have been observed why edema observed due to the massive hyperplasia of the epithelium of the bile duct so in the epithelium of the bile duct that got that become hyperplastic 
and due to this hyperplasia there is alteration of the selective permeability okay and due to that the plasma protein is drained out from the bile duct wall this is very important the plasma protein is drained out from the bile duct wall and that results into hyperproteinemia so decrease in the protein level of the blood high sorry hypoproteinemia decrease in the protein level of the blood hypoproteinemia and due to hypoproteinemia there will be less colloidal osmotic pressure in the plasma so the osmotic colloidal pressure of the plasma will decrease and due to this the fluid will try to come out from the plasma into the tissue from the tissue and that will result into the edema and where this edema is observed the fluids come out where the loose skin is available for example in the submandibular region and like this so submandibular edema is very much common and important characteristics feature found in the fasciolosis and seems to be an important diagnostic finding another condition that also uh, occur due to in chronic um, uh, fasciolosis that is the clay pipe stem liver because the bile duct become dark sorry hard enough so much that it cannot be cut by the sharp knife it becomes so much hard and this condition is known as clay pipe stem liver okay and not only bile duct but uh, also the gallbladder is also affected and hyperplasia occurs here and in long uh, standing causes anemia is another sequel uh, sequelae which is uh, initially normocytic normochromatic but later it's become macrocytic hypochromic anemia is also observed in case of fasciola okay and so the clinical signs and symptoms uh, based on the pathogenesis as i have already uh, discussed and now coming to the diagnosis for diagnosis obviously the first and most important and the common method to diagnose is the fecal sample examination to uh, detect the if the eggs are detected into the feces of the animals that becomes a confirmatory diagnosis and there are also some other diagnostic processes sir. for example enzyme estimations okay uh, the because there will be some enzyme like glutamate dehydrogenase and glutamate transpeptidase it is the indicative step of diagnosis of this disease okay these enzymes will be elevated and there are also tests uh, <coughs> also different other tests are there and uh, for very recently ELISA like uh, sandwich ELISA, dot ELISA, western blot etc these are also used uh, for the direction of the pathogen for direction of this parasite okay and now coming to the treatment obviously there should be anti-parasitic drug and what are the most common drugs used for the treatment of fasciola they are oxyclozanide and this oxyclozanide is very much important because it is effective against both mature and immature flow as i have already told you that immature or juvenile flow can cause also the problem specifically as i told you in case of acute cases so oxyclozanide what is the dose 15 milligram per kg of body weight oxyclozanide another one is rapoxanide that can or that can also be used triclavendazole that can also be used okay then coming to the control traditional there are several traditional method to control the disease for example treatment with the of the animal with the anti parasitic drug and the animals should not be allowed to graze in the field of lowland area where the water reservoirs like river pond lake are present as i told you the grasses or the vegetation around the river or the lake or the pond they are very much important source of the metasarcaria their are, metasarcaria are is present in those so the animals should not be allowed to graze around the water bodies to stop to to check this infection and this water reservoir if water reservoir is there it should be fenced stop so that animal could not able to reach there then the feces should be disposed of as i have so told you the eggs are present or disposed of from the animals the eggs are coming out to the feces and comes to the environment so the feces should be disposed of properly so that it uh, can't be a source of infection for the other animals the grasses should be fed in form of hay or silage okay so if the, the grasses are treated like in where it is it is being made silage so there will be chance of infection underwater underground water should be provided to the animal irrespective of instead of pond water or something and uh, the anti prophylactic uh, prophylactically we can also give the medicines as a prophylactic control we can also control the intermediate host as i have told you snails so if molluscicides are spread in the environment or the snails are being controlled 
that can also help in the controlling of this uh, disease okay and very recently vaccines are also being made for the treatment of this parasite and uh, there are purified protein or definite antigen for example glutathione S transferase or cathepsin L or hemoglobin uh, and uh, hemoglobin FABP they are under research for the vaccination and uh, which can be given to the animal to get rid of this uh, infection so that was all about fasciola fasciola hepatica and fasciola gigantica